All right, good morning. Let's, um, well, let's turn our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 2, and then I just want to make a few comments before we get started. Um, We had the privilege to be, some of you know, many of you know, to be in London a few weeks ago. And uh, one of the things that came to my mind, and everybody sees sees things a little bit differently, but one of the things that came to my mind when we were in London, seeing the churches... And, and the size of everything and the religion of it all was these words together, runaway religion, <laughs> runaway religion. And so I want to exhort you this morning about just an important principle in, in Christian living um, and being part of the body of Christ, which most of you or maybe all of you are this morning. Um, I wrote it down this way, if you, the church, the body of Christ, if we're, if we're not searching the scriptures ourselves, it doesn't take long for a, a good-looking, well-dressed, persuasive preacher, <laughs> not calling out any names or anything, <laughs> uh, to have the church well off track in a relatively short amount of time. <laughs> um, and we saw evidence of, I did anyway, of a thousand years of this. <laughs> plus, plus in the UK. So it was a, for me, it was a powerful encouragement to make sure I'm searching the scriptures to see if these things be true. Um, the, the scriptures don't, doesn't, it doesn't say trust the preacher with all of your heart. It says trust the Lord with all of your heart. Um, it's, I'm, I'm taking the weight off my shoulders here a bit, but it's not the preacher's responsibility to make sure you um, are coming to grips with what the scripture is saying. We play a role in that, um, but it's your responsibility. Um, via the Holy Spirit working in your life, it's your responsibility. Uh, as you study the Bible and meditate on his word, uh, we were up in Hundred Mile House, and I had a chance to uh, stay with the host up there, Don, and and Mike Atwood was there, and Jeff Johnson, the other speaker, and I was talking. We had breakfast together. It was it was a wonderful time of fellowship. And Mike Atwood, he confessed. Who here knows Mike Atwood? A few of you probably do. Kind of knows his Bible pretty well. He confessed that on, on one particular doctrine. Um, um, which is an important one, but I, I won't say which one it was. But he said because uh, it doesn't matter. He said it took him um, the better part of eight years to land on on what his understanding of what that scripture was teaching. And so when things are hard, when, when, when Bible study is hard, when the topic is hard, there's great, the reward is greater when you get to the place where you have some clarity on something. And not only is the reward greater, but, but your, your, um, your ability to be shaken is, is low. Um, I was, I was, I'm going to pick on Jenna because she's here, but she's, she's trying to be a nurse. And one of the tests you have to take, which is an important test, it's a, it's a ratio test, I think it is. You have to, uh, when you're, when you're administering drugs to your patients, you have to get the ratios right. <laughs> it's really important. And so I think it, she said you had to get 95 or 98 or something. Was it 98? Yeah, you had to get 95%, otherwise you failed. Because it was important. And many of the students, maybe Jen included, I don't know, I think maybe, had to, had to, had to do a little do-over. And, and when things are hard, she got 100% when she did the do-over which is encouraging if she ever has to administer anything to me. <laughs> um, when things are hard, the reward of getting there and, and getting to the place of understanding, when you put a lot of work into it, it's just that much greater. 
And another analogy I want to add to this as we carry on. Um, sorry, we have little friends up here. Um, is there's greater strength when when your understanding of scripture is tied to one verse. Um, it's much more easy to be shaken and rocked. When your understanding of a, of a concept or an idea or a teaching in Scripture is attached to 10 or 15 or 50 or 100 verses, you can imagine all those roots anchored in the Word of God, and you know you've studied it. You might not remember where they all are, but you know you're rooted in all of these places. Boy, is it a lot harder to get knocked off an understanding of scripture and and we have a, a big issue in the church today is if we're lucky a lot of folks are anchored to one verse and a lot of times it's a verse that they've just heard from somebody from a preacher and so that makes sense to me I'm good with that and they roll with it and then the wind comes and the rains come and the storms come and, and they're and this one little root on a little verse is just torn right t- torn right off sometimes and so it's important on 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 your part and our part as, as the body of Christ to be searching the scriptures and, and finding, finding our roots in the, in the whole counsel of God, if you can envision these roots. You know, some of the trees that withstand the storms of, of this world that come rolling through, boy, they got, they got roots that go hundreds of feet sometimes in all directions. And that, that's the kind of root we ought to have. It takes time, but that's the kind of root we ought to have in, in this in the word of God. And I, I, we can't, nobody can do that for, for you. You need to do that for you, young and old. Um, and so it's important. So never in the history of the church has there been more access to the word of God than there is today. Search the scriptures to see if these things be true. So that's, that's my exhortation to open this morning. It's very important. And, and some of these topics um, in Scripture, they're, they're not the simplest topics in the world. There's a lot, of, a lot of connections, a lot of verses. So that's my prayer for you this morning. Um, just pray, pray with me, and then we'll, then, we'll, then we'll read our passage. Father, we just want to ask for your help this morning. We thank you for the teaching that's been done already, and we pray as we carry, as we carry on in Second Thessalonians. We just pray for good understanding. Uh, and we do pray. We pray that the body of Christ would be strong, Father. We 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 understand that, um, as we heard last week from from Joe, that wind and persecution and trials are coming. And so we pray that the body of Christ um, here at Westview and and in Victoria and, and beyond would be strong, well rooted in Your Word. Um, may our our Christianity not be shallow, but may it be deep, and. Uh, and so we ask for your help this morning in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so first, second, Thessalonians. Just read with me. I'll read through it real quick, and then we'll discuss. Uh, Steve went through one through four, and we're going to carry on. Um, second Thessalonians 2. All right. Now, brethren, uh, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you, not to be soon shaken or in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume 
with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in, in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, be rooted, and, and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and every good word and work. <clears throat> so this letter, as we carry on um, at verse five, this letter was written, it was written as a reminder. Who here needs reminders? Everybody here needs reminders. Somebody needs to remind some of you to raise your hand. Um, everybody needs reminders. Um, it was a reinforcement of what Paul had been teaching them earlier at some point in person. Um, so in other words, Paul's saying, I told you these things the last time I was with you. Don't you remember? And so he wrote a letter because he had heard that they were having trouble remembering some of the things he was teaching. Um, how easily we, we Christians forget. I think there's a reason why we're called to regularly remember the Lord in the breaking of the bread, because if we don't do that, we forget. We forget the significance of the sacrifice um, that Christ made for us. It becomes a, a little thing in the corner of Christianity, if that, rather than a big thing. Um, it's not a religious thing. We talk about that often in the mornings. It's not a religious thing, but if we don't do it regularly, we'll, we'll forget the gravity of the sacrifice will, will fade as life is filled with distractions. And so it made me think of actually of Second Peter. I'll just read this, Second Peter 1, 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. It's okay to say, this, say something over and over again to make sure it gets in. Um, verse 6, And now you know, you know what is restraining that he, this is referring to the Antichrist, may be revealed in his own time. So we have in verse 6, we have something is restraining Antichrist, and also someone, someone, in verse 7, is restraining Antichrist. Verse 7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Um, it's interesting, this, this phrase, the mystery of lawlessness, is already at work. Um, who knows the hour or the day of Christ's return? Nobody, except, except the Father. And that means, to me, because Satan is a somebody and nobody knows, that Satan doesn't know the day or the hour. He knows it's coming, because Satan knows Scripture likely, I would expect, better than all of us do, put together. Um, he knows, but he doesn't know the day or the hour. And so Satan has had to be ready for the day or the hour ever since, I would suggest, ever since that prophecy was made. And... Um, a candidate ready 
for the position of Antichrist. Um, 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And sometimes we, I, I feel like we can see flavors of Antichrist sort of brewing, ready to go at any moment's notice when the time is right, when the restraint is removed that, that is currently restraining Satan. As the day of the Lord, the day of Christ approaches, it seems this will be a point of increased activity in the devil's deceptions. Matthew 24, 24 says, For false Christs, plural, and false prophets, plural, will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. There's a lot of scripture, which I won't get into today, about um, not being alarmed when you see what you think Christ is, because when Christ comes, boy, the world's going to know it's Christ. He won't be in a corner, he won't be in a room somewhere, hiding somewhere. The entire world, top to bottom, every time zone in the world somehow is going to recognize when Christ comes, there'll be no mistake that it's Christ. But if you're not paying attention and you're not searching the scriptures, you'll potentially be led astray by somebody in power and signs and wonder coming into this world professing to be Christ. It says to lead astray, even, even if it's even possible, even the elect. Uh, Daniel 11 in the Old Testament says, In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And so this mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Um, it's interesting. The he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The, the, the restraining, the sense of the word restrainer, or uh, um, the out of the way, the sense of it, from what I can tell, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I looked up a bunch of stuff trying to sort through all this. And the sense of it is, is, is a restrainer who's standing in the way and then stepping aside and no longer in the way. Um, or as I've often said, holding on to the rope and then giving a little, little extra rope and giving room uh, for Antichrist to come only at the right time, at the appointed time. The commentaries, like William MacDonald and a bunch of others I read, they're all over the place on who this identity might be, which is interesting to me, because I always sort of thought I had my mind made up about it. They were, they were suggesting some of them. Even MacDonald listed all these. He said it could have been maybe, maybe it's the Roman government, maybe it's the Jewish state, maybe it's Michael the Archangel, maybe it's the church, maybe it's the Holy Spirit. There's all these suggestions. Um, In Matthew 12, 29, there's a story. Maybe turn to Matthew 12, 29. Wow, we got all kinds of fun things here tonight. Forgive me if I jump suddenly because there's little, little friendlies up here. We need a restrainer. Matthew 12, 29. It's a simple verse. It's a simple concept. So I hope this will help us maybe help identify who the restrainer is. I feel like they're actually coming down from up there. That's exciting. Okay. Matthew 12, 29. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? That's a simple concept, right? You can't get into the house unless you bind the strong man. So this, the... Simple question is, is what do you need to bind a strong man or a strong person? What do you need? You need a stronger man. Stronger. There's many men in here I wouldn't be able to, to bind because I'm not strong enough. Now, of these of this list of, of entities that are on these you know, this potential list of restrainers, which of these forces is stronger 
than the devil and his angels to restrain them from allowing Antichrist to show up on the throne and making himself to be a god in a Jewish temple. Is the Roman government stronger than <laughs> Satan and his, uh, and his cohorts? I don't think so. How about the, Jew, the Jewish state? I don't, I don't think so. Michael the archangel, just one, versus Satan and his... I don't, I don't think so. The church is often considered, in, 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 in a great, for a great many good reasons, to consider about um, it, it as an entity being the restrainer. Um, one of the scriptures that... A couple of things to consider. Um, I couldn't find a scripture that said the church was great, but I could find scripture that said he who is in the church was great. And so the credit goes to the, the Lord God Almighty and the Holy Spirit in us. That, that's what makes the church great. It's not actually you and me with our muscles. We're not restraining anything. I also found it interesting, and I, I, I don't want to get in trouble with this. I found it in no commentary, but this prophecy... Satan knew about the Antichrist reality. It had to come one day. He knew about it back when Daniel was written. 530, 540 B.C. And in around B.C. 37, Harold, uh, Harold, Herod, we'll get to Harold later, sorry. <laughs> Herod built a temple that was a perfectly good temple for Antichrist to show up in, not at the right time. And so the restrainer, whoever that is, needed to be there at that time, when that temple was around, to restrain Antichrist from coming into the temple. And the, and the church wasn't there before, before Christ came. But the Holy Spirit was. Boy, the Holy Spirit was. And so you can see where I'm leaning with this, and I'm going to have elders coming up to me with their Bibles open after the message probably. But my, my suspicion and my convictions is that the, uh, the, the restrainer of, of Antichrist is, is the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit. And he works in many ways, and he works through the church currently. But he's been restraining before the church was even born um, to, to prevent Antichrist from showing up when he's not supposed to show up. Um, and so in my mind, I'm imagining him letting out just a little bit of rope to Satan to carry on this next step right at the exact time in, in the Lord's plan when the time is right for Antichrist to be revealed. It's also important to, in this notion of stepping aside that the Holy Spirit, as the restrainer, doesn't vanish entirely from the earth because he removes the restraining power on Satan, certainly, but salvation is a wonderful thing, and it's a, it's a thing that requires the work of the Holy Spirit. It just can't happen without the work of the Holy Spirit and salvation. John 3, 5 says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's a supernatural, spiritual work that grabs onto somebody's soul, opens their eyes to see. We're praying that that would be today for any of you that haven't believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, salvation always requires the work of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and B, after Antichrist is revealed, an uncountable number of souls, Scripture says, will be saved. Um, Revelation, turn to Revelation 7. Revelation 7. Starting at verse 9. John says this, he said in Revelation 7, verse 9, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, so whatever that, you know, France, Germany, every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages. I mean, every language under the sun. I think there's pushing 600, I've heard 6,000, but there's at least 600 languages on earth. 
all, all he said uh, a great multitude from every nation all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb and then one of the elders verse 13 addressed me saying who are these clothed in white robes rather and from where have they come i said to them sir you know and he said to me these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb and so massive salvation and the holy spirit has to be there for that and so the holy spirit won't be he'll be out of the way but he won't be out of the scene he's this restraining portion i believe that he's exercising today uh, will be removed but he'll still be here working away in the souls of, of folks that need to know and need to put their faith in the lord jesus christ verse 8 back to our text again back back to verse 8 and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming there'll be so much light at the second coming of the lord jesus that the antichrist will be consumed brought to nothing when he comes some of the other versions say and the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming just arriving on the scene will be enough without even swinging a single sword when, when christ arrives verse 9 the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of satan with all power signs and lying wonders and i want to say a couple of things about this number one the antichrist will be the work of satan and he's boy he's ready to go i believe that today he's ready to do his thing and it, then it says um the antichrist will come with all power signs and lying wonders well, what, what does that mean all power signs and lying wonders well the sense of this word all in the greek is is this in one of the definitions it said all inherent power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature satan isn't all powerful praise the lord um, but all that satan is and all that the nature of satan is none of that will be held back all power all of satan's power will be i've got notes here satan will be leaving nothing on the table nothing of his nature on the table he will be holding nothing of himself back when he comes as the antichrist and this remarkable display of power will manifest itself in tremendous false signs and lying wonders it's a very important point to remember here and 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 it's easy to forget too but miracles when we see miracles miracles are not a reliable confirmation that what you're experiencing is of the lord i want to say that again because we have to be very careful with this miracles are not a reliable confirmation that what you're experiencing is of the lord satan is quite capable of doing things way beyond what we think the laws of physics are able to do he can't do what the lord can do but he's going to come in all of his power with signs and lying wonders and it's going to be a tremendously compelling deception in things that are going to look like miracles and so we must be careful um, a lot of people base their confirmation in their like mormons especially i believe in miracles not discerning where they're coming from and not searching the scriptures to see if these things be true and so it's very important that we have our discernment up on full alert when we see miracles those will be the things that deceive even the elect at the end of the days those are the kind of things that are going to draw them away when christ hasn't come yet and so verse 10 says with all unrighteous deception 
That's in a nutshell. All unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Or another, another version will say, in all, with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And there's a couple of really, really important points here too. Um, there's going to be massive unrighteous deception and there's going to be massive unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. So the lost. And then there's a very interesting because here in the text. That's really important, the because. If you can see it there, those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, or those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. It doesn't say those who are perishing who hadn't heard the truth. It doesn't say those who are perishing who didn't know the truth. It doesn't say those who uh, are perishing who knew the truth. It says those who are perishing who refuse to love the truth and so be saved. They heard it. They knew it. And they were they refused. They, that's on them. It's not on the Lord. They refused to love the truth and be saved. There's a scripture that says, we, we will not have this man to rule over us. You can't say that unless you know who the man is. And then you refuse the man. John 14, 6. They refuse the truth. They refuse to love the truth. Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those who are perishing, they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So a fair question to ask of all of us who have ears to hear today, in here and online, if you're online listening. Um, do you love the Lord Jesus? Do you love his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection, his conquering of death in the grave? Do you love the Lord Jesus? With all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the truth that they might be saved. The result of this refusal to love is in verse 11. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Or another version says, therefore God sends them a strong delusion that they may believe what is false. They've refused to love the truth, and so now, during the tribulation, and I think it might happen in these days as well sometimes, they will be handed over by God himself to fully believe the lies of the Antichrist. And once you're handed over by God, that's game over. <laughs> you will no longer be able to see. Verse 12 gives us one more piece of information on why those who are perishing refuse to love the truth. It says that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Had pleasure in unrighteousness. Rather than loving the truth, they love their unrighteousness. Do we see that happening in the world today? And it'll be more and more as the days go on. One of the problems of a, a capitalist economic system is it, capitalism serves up what the people want. It goes by demand. And so one of the issues we have in our world today is capitalism is serving up what people want. <laughs> people love their unrighteousness. Um, so the question is, where do you gen genuinely find your pleasures today? In the Lord Jesus Christ or in your unrighteousness? Hard question, but it's a very important question. You, f you find yourself dragging yourself to church, but looking forward to the things you know are wrong. Or, or is it the other way around? Looking forward to church and dragging yourself out of the disaster of the things that you, where you've tripped and fallen again into the things you know are wrong. Paul, 
had no pleasure in his unrighteousness. He hated it. Who will rescue me from this body of death? He'd had enough of it. The things I don't want to do, I do. He wasn't happy about it. The things I want to do, I don't do. It was a battle. And it is a battle. But the battle is won in the direction of our love. Do we love the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth? Or do we love unrighteousness and have pleasure in unrighteousness? We're almost there. Verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. That is an entire message in that one verse, which is not going to be given today. You can search the scriptures. There's a lot of big words in there and concepts. Sanctification and being chosen from the beginning. And Verse 14, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And this is what Joe was saying to us last week. The storms are coming. Stand fast and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Some of you might wonder, what are these traditions that were taught by Paul's spoken word? Are we, are we missing something? We weren't there to hear those things. So let me just say this. This is very important also. In the completed word of God, in, this, in Scripture, all of the necessary truths of whatever these unspoken words were, all of that truth um, has been written down for us in the word of God all of it that we need we're not we're not missing anything we're not missing anything um, i'll just quickly read second peter but it says this second peter 1 3 says his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence and this 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 is our knowledge of him this is where it comes from. So we have everything that we need in Scripture to understand who Christ is. We're not missing any secret sermons that were given to the Thessalonians. We've got everything we need in the pages of completed Scripture. And then verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, other, other versions will say eternal comfort, who, could, who, who likes the idea of eternal comfort? Yeah, me too. Me and Dominic. Nobody else. Oh, there's a few over here. Eternal comfort and good hope by grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. And boy, to be established in your, your words and established in your work by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. That's when you realize who you're working for. When you show up in the morning, you're not really working for your boss. I mean, you are, but you're really working for, for the Lord. And then when that's your perspective and that's your love and that's your joy, that's when your, your plans are established. Lots to digest in all of this. So let me just jump back to my exhortation at the beginning before I get in trouble with the time. Acts 17.11, they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see to find out whether these things were so. And I expect that of you, to not just listen to what I'm saying and say, it sounds good to me. I'll just close with a quote. Uh, I quote Spurgeon a lot. We read his church in London, so anyway. It says this, He that has come once is to come again. He will come a second time. The Lord will come. He will come again, for he has promised to return. We have his own word for it. Jesus Christ has given us his word, in, in a sense. He's promised. And I know for a fact that the Lord's word is good. It's, it's good. So, just close in prayer. Food for thought this morning. Father, we thank you for this time to consider these things. Um, lots of heavy subjects. We pray for... Uh, Again, good understanding. I pray that each one of us here would be um, not compelled is not the right word. I just pray that each one of us here would be excited about searching the scriptures daily to see if 
whatever it is they've heard from a pulpit or from a preacher or from a YouTube video to search the scriptures to see if these things be true. And may our roots be deep in the word of God in the church in these last days um, when the winds are sure to come. We pray these things. Thank you for everyone here. We pray there be rejoicing in heaven today, maybe over a, any, even one sinner who's put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.